Always speak truthfully and forcefully. Do not be a politician ever. Playing politics doesn't work. If you think that if you're going to say plant-based instead of vegan, that that's going to make somebody listen, you're sorely mistaken. If you think that by saying, I'm an animal advocate instead of an animal liberation activist, that someone's going to listen, it is completely untrue. After talking to 60,000 people, I've realized and learned that people are ready to listen to the message or they're not, no matter how you act. I can be as sweet as Gandhi or as radical as early Malcolm X, and it will not change one person's mind about the issue of veganism and animal rights. It all depends upon the person, whether they're willing to listen. I'll give an example. A couple times a year, I have speeches that turn into a Jerry Springer show. People want to scream and yell at me. I don't want to do it, but they want to start. So recently, one of these lectures happened, and the student told me that I was rude and abrasive. I said, okay. Do you think everybody feels that way? And they said yes. I said, well, we're going to take a vote on that. There were about 40 students in the class. I said, raise your hand if you thought I was rude and abrasive. Seven people raised their hands. So I said, okay, that leaves 33 people that didn't think I was rude and abrasive and listened to what I had to say. So I pointed to the student and I said, maybe the problem isn't me. Maybe the problem is you. And you, and I pointed to the seven people. If I'm giving the same speech to the same crowd and 33 people like it and seven people didn't, I can't be the problem. So again, what I'm saying is those seven people came into that classroom unwilling to listen, no matter what I did, no matter what I said. In fact, there have been some lectures where I've gotten on my hands and knees and begged people to stop killing animals. My wife Erica witnessed one of these lectures at University of Central Florida. This guy was being rude and abrasive himself and mean and stubborn and stupid. So I got on my knees sincerely and I said, please, please stop killing the animals. And if you're not going to stop killing them for the animals, stop doing it for me, your fellow human. Look what it's doing to me. And he looked at me dead in the eye and said, no. So my point is, politics never works. It's always better to speak the truth and be honest. And when I condemn politics and politicians, think about this. All the people that we collectively admire, Gandhi and Dr. King and Malcolm X and Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, Henry David Thoreau, none of the people that we collectively admire was a politician. They were all activists. So I will ask activists to stop playing political games, say what needs to be said, explain the murder, the Holocaust that's taking place, explain the rapes that happen to animals on a daily basis. Don't be afraid to say these words. These animals are suffering horribly. And when we sit around and play political games, it doesn't benefit them in one bit. I'd say to that person, first of all, you just prove that humans don't have intelligence. Anybody that would make a claim that animals don't feel and they're not smart are completely idiotic, stupid, selfish, and speciesistic. Uh, it's insane to think that animals don't feel. If they don't feel, then when we torture them and they scream in pain, when they're being hung upside down in a slaughterhouse, what are they screaming from? Nothing. When we light them on fire and burn research and they scream. And then the animal researcher claims, well, we gave them anesthetic so they wouldn't feel. Well, if they didn't feel, what do you give them anesthetic for? So they don't feel? Nothing? It's completely insane. Animals have the same... Well, when it comes to pain and suffering, animals and humans are completely, completely equal. That's for sure. And animals are also rational beings, too. There's a big myth out there that only humans are rational and aware. You know, if animals are flying in a V formation, if they're hiding when they don't want to be seen, if they can locate water to drink, if they can find shade on a sunny day and sink warmth when it's cold, okay, that's logical thought. They're always being logical. We don't have the right to, but I understand why people feel this way, which is why I want to educate and talk to them and teach them the truth. But you bring up something very important. Our parents are full of lies, completely full of lies because of what their parents told them and what their parents told their parents and what society tells people and religion and government. So 
what I want to tell people is don't believe things just because your mommy and daddy told you so. And mom and dad have no clue about ethics in most cases, have no clue about how the world should be working, have no clue about proper human to animal relationships. Fortunately, all the vegans I know broke away from their parents and from their parents' training, and they are now thinking logically and compassionately for the first time. If I can go into more detail about family, I know my wife doesn't like this, but I think family is the downfall of society because people end up living for their families, doing whatever their families want, never cutting that invisible umbilical cord that still exists. People would be a lot happier if they cut loose from their families once they hit the age of 18, trust me. No, I think my mom is completely psychotic. I think my sister and her family are completely psychotic. They've actually stopped talking to me because I care about animals. Where's the logic and the sanity in this? I can talk to groups of strangers and they break down and cry and tell me that I've changed their lives and my own mother, my own sister and her family won't even listen to me. In fact, I'll tell you about the last time we talked. It was August 19th last year on my birthday. I was passing through Illinois where they live. I was there for one day because that's all I can take from my family anyways. It's not like we were close before that. But we went out to lunch to a place that just put vegan burgers on the menu. I assume we were all getting vegan burgers because I have a rule that I established in 1997 and it's if you want to sit down and eat with me, you eat vegan. Oh, we don't eat together. I'll see you later on. So we go there and we order and I hear macaroni and cheese being ordered. I hear a fish filet being ordered. I hear a vegan burger from my nephew Jacob and then I hear double cheese. So Erica knows how I am. I turned to her and I said, did I just hear what I thought I heard? And she, she didn't even want to acknowledge. She's like, yeah. So I explained to my family, I go, you guys know when the last time you saw me? It was one year and seven months ago before that. So we figured it out. It was about 585 days. I said, times that by three, three meals a day. So we agreed to about 1,800. And then at the top of my voice, I said, you guys have had 1,800 meals to eat whatever you wanted to eat. Today, when I'm in town, you can't have one meal without dead animals and the things that come out of these murdered animals. And I stood up and I left. Walked out, called a taxi cab, took a taxi back to my mom's house, jumped in my car, and left. And again, they still think that I'm irrational for this when they're the ones that are psychotic. 1,800 meals? You can't have one meal without dead animals? But this is the mentality of most meat eaters and of parents too, because parents also hate to admit that they're wrong. Boy, a parent would hate to say, oh, I taught you something wrong, when I don't get this because you can't be right all the time. I don't know why parents, like most people, can't just acknowledge the fact that they made a mistake, make amends, apologize for the way they've been living, and evolve, change, move forward. And I don't think the problem of animal abuse and, and, and omnivorism is any different in China than it is in America. Everybody has this false belief that they, everybody, every time I talk to somebody from a different ethnicity, they say, oh, but I'm Filipino. We really eat a lot of meat over there. Like you eat more meat than we eat in America, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everybody does animals, animal flesh for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's not worse in China or in India than it is anywhere else. And if I happen to get America or Israel or Italy to go vegan first, that's still a victory. And then we'll just move on to another country and get them to go vegan. That's how it's going to work. I doubt it's all going to happen at once. There's going to be a mass revelation, an epiphany, and the whole world's going to go vegan overnight. Change, unfortunately, doesn't happen that way. I mean, we can look right now in many parts of the world. Women, for example, have achieved equal status, but in most parts of the world, they haven't. So just like women's rights isn't going to happen all at once, neither will animal rights. But you keep on talking and preaching and teaching, and you get animal and women's rights over here and animal rights over here, human rights over here, animal rights over here, and then eventually we're going to have a peaceful planet where everybody can be treated fairly and equally. First, on the issue of tactical violence, I want people to go to my website, 
ADAPT, A-D-A-P-T-T, ADAPT.org. I want you to click Other Animal Rights Issues, and then click What's Wrong with Violence, and actually read the essays that I've written instead of bits and pieces online. And I want to further now talk about the issue of violence. I don't believe anyone is really opposed to violence, especially after talking to 60,000 people. In fact, in Israel last month, I proved this to every crowd because I was asked about the issue of violence. So I said to the crowd, raise your hand if you are opposed to the Allied forces going into Auschwitz and Birkenau and murdering Nazis to save Jews and gypsies and homosexuals. Not one person raised their hand. So let me clarify this. No one's opposed to violence. People are just opposed to who I propose to be violent for, the animals. Nobody thinks animals are worthy enough to receive violence on their behalf. Well, I think the chickens and the turkeys and the pigs and the cows disagree vehemently, and I disagree too. In fact, if you want to think about this further, if you had a pacifist, and you had somebody like me who does practice pacifism but believes that violence has its place, would you want a pacifist fighting for you? Or would you want me fighting for you? Because I'm going to get you out. I'm going to get you out of the torture chamber. I'm going to get you out of the slaughterhouse. The pacifist is going to hold the side and say, hey, please set them free. I'm going to go in with guns drawn. And let me explain this too. If I went into a slaughterhouse and had guns drawn, and people had knives against the throats of pigs, and I said, you drop your knives. The killing is over. It's done. Let them go. It's over. I'm the one doing the noble act. I'm stopping the murderers. Because unfortunately, there's a segment of our population that won't stop no matter what until you put a gun to their head. Until you treat them like the victims are treated. And I want to clarify something else. Because during this essay on violence I wrote, I wrote a line that said that I think that women in fur coat and men in fur coats, I said men too, should be raped. The reason I said that is because foxes in the fur industry are anally electrocuted, standard method of death. Take a steel rod, lift up a fox's tail, shove it in their ass and electrocute them. That's a rape. Chinchillas in the fur industry, standard method of death is vaginal electrocution. So they're raping animals right now. I hope that rapists get raped. And when the rapists stop raping the animals, I'll stop wishing that the rapists get raped. Please understand what I say, what I'm saying there. They're the ones bringing this on themselves. If they didn't rape and kill and pillage and murder, I wouldn't wish anything horrible on them. And I want to clarify this too about my wishes. My wishes don't come true. It's a wish of mine. I'm not asking anybody to do this. I hope that evil things happen to evil people. I'm sorry, I just can't bring it in my heart to have any empathy and love for evil people. I hope Nazis get raped. I hope child molesters get raped. I hope rapists get raped. I hope murderers get raped. I hope people that do evil things have evil things happen to them. And that's the whole point of my essay. I know people want me to be Gandhi, but I'm not. I don't claim to be Gandhi. In fact, if you ask me, my hero is early Malcolm X, who also supported a violent retaliatory response. And that's all I'm saying. If the time comes when we have to pick up arms, take arms, bear arms to go liberate the animals, we're going to be on the right side of justice. Just like the Allied forces were on the right side of justice. Pacifism, unfortunately, is what allows victims to be victimized. Pacifism doesn't solve problems of torture and abuse. It's a nice notion. It's a cute story. And let me say this again. For 11 years, straight years, that's all I do is pacifist lectures. I educate people. Okay? But it doesn't liberate the animals completely. It helps. I don't think the whole movement should change from its pacifist ways and take up arms, but I think violence needs to be part of this revolution like it's been part of every revolution that has ever existed. There's a big lie out there that, that Dr. King liberated blacks in America. No, he didn't. The Black Panthers were part of that movement too. Malcolm X was part of that movement too. It wasn't all Dr. King and it wasn't all Gandhi in India either. 
Most of his followers killed British soldiers, set fires and riots. And let me bring one more thing up about pacifism. Gandhi, who I admire a lot, okay? But pacifism can be taken too far, just like violence can be taken too far. Do you know what Gandhi's solution to the Holocaust was? He thought that all the Jews should have committed suicide to rouse the conscience of the world to their plight. Well, I admire the Mahatma a lot, but let me say this. Okay, the Mahatma lost his fucking mind when he said that Jews should have committed suicide. That is completely psychotic, and this is how pacifism cannot always be the answer. The Jews shouldn't have had to kill themselves because they were being tortured and killed by Nazis. The Nazis needed to be murdered, and they were. That stopped it. Another myth out there, too, if I can say one more thing, is that violence begets violence. Boy, pacifists love to say violent. There's no proof to that. What was the violence after the Allied forces killed the Nazis? No, that violence stopped violence. It didn't, it didn't create any more violence. It stopped it dead in its tracks. It's over. So my point is, don't be so quick to condemn a violent response. I'm not asking people to blow up McDonald's. Okay, that, that's insane. Okay, those people are robots need to teach the robots, need to deprogram and unbrainwash people. But the, the direct killers, the direct abusers of animals, sometimes need more than a lecture and a demonstration. I don't say this with glee. It doesn't make me happy to say all this stuff that I just said. I wish people understood logic and compassion. Sadly, a lot of people don't. And it's kind of interesting, too, that meat eaters and people that wear fur coats and hunters and vivisectionists condemn the violence that I wish about when they're committing it every single day. They kill, let's not forget, meat eaters and people that wear fur coats. They're the most violent people on this planet. It's all kind of uh, irrational and illogical and unfair, too, that people who are violent condemn a violent response to their violence. <laughs> Veganism is the most ethical way to live, and that's why people choose veganism. It causes the least amount of pain and suffering intentionally on this planet. So that's why there's so many people wanting to be vegan. It's the same reason I chose veganism. I don't want to cause pain and suffering to somebody that has never harmed me or harmed anyone else on this planet. I mean, when was the last time a chicken or a cow attacked a human being? How about never? A pig? Turkey, never. We're the ones that attack them. So it's logical to want to be vegan, to want to reduce and eliminate pain and suffering. Even though we have fantasies sometimes about harming people that harm animals, it's logical. It's not psychotic to want to harm somebody that's murdering somebody else. I mean, again, if you have love for Nazis, you need to see a psychiatrist. If you want to protect a child molester, you need to seek some serious medical help. There are certain people that are not worthy of having, there are certain people that are not worthy enough to be treated fairly and equally. When you violate somebody else's right to be free, I think you've given up your right to be treated fairly and freely and equally as well. And I'm not running around attacking people. I don't have a machete or a nine millimeter. Okay, I'm not shooting anybody. When I talk about the violence that needs to happen, that will happen one day, I'm explaining that I'm not going to condemn it. And I think it would be wrong for any animal rights person to condemn an act of justified violence against somebody who victimizes innocent beings. People, I'm, I'm shocked that people are so shocked when I wish rape upon somebody that's evil. At least in America, every time a child molester or a rapist gets sent to prison, people make a joke and it's, I can't wait till Bubba or Tyrone gets a hold of him in prison. All the time people wish rape on somebody else. The problem is, see, we all accept that child molestation and rape are evil. We just don't accept that murdering animals and raping animals and anal electrocution of foxes are evil. That's the only difference. It's not the, again, it's not the rape thing. People wish it all the time on somebody that's bad. 
And about capital punishment, I'm going to go back to the same thing. If you've taken away somebody else's right to live, if you violated somebody else, a child molester, a rapist, or a murderer, there's only three groups of criminals that should be executed, you've given up your right to be treated fairly and equally. On top of that, since animals suffer the most and people in prison are eating animals, it's illogical to want to keep people alive in prison because then beautiful animals have to be murdered and killed to feed a child molester? You've got to be out of your mind. I wouldn't kill a tick on the back of a mosquito to save a child molester. And people, you know, we get asked this question all the time, who was drowning? If a human was drowning or an animal was drowning, who would you save? Well, it depends who the human was. You gonna save Jerry Sandusky, the Penn State coach that just got convicted of raping like 50 children? You really gonna, gonna go up in a canoe and save his life? I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the, uh, the oar and I'm gonna hit him over the head and make sure that he drowns. I would never, there are, there are so many groups of humans that aren't worth saving at all. But people are so in love with humans and so full of vengeance and so full of hate against animals, people will make illogical statements like, oh, all human life is valuable. No, it's not. Look around the planet. Most human life is not valuable. In fact, I can prove this to you. Do you know if you removed humans from this planet, the removal of our species would benefit everything that exists. It would benefit not only the animals, it would benefit the insects, it would benefit the water, the air, the mountains. If we're the only ones that are expendable on this planet, why do people think we're so important? Because if you took the ants off this planet, the whole system would collapse. The bees, and the bees are dying off. You've been following the news for the last 10 years. When the bees go, we're about two to three years behind the bees. That's how valuable bees are take us out, everything gets better. Now, as I say this, I don't think it has to be this way. Again, this is why I want to educate people and talk to people and teach them how to live compassionately and altruistically and peacefully on this planet. But right now, we've gone awry. We're, 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 we're like the worst bacteria that has ever existed on this planet. And peace begins at the dinner table. Again, if you can start you know, giving compassion to the animal kingdom, to the insect kingdom, then you start living peacefully with the planet and with each other. I don't want any innocent being, being, being you know, executed by our governments. Okay, I want DNA to be used. Okay, but there are certain cases where people are flat out guilty of rape, child molestation, and murder. There, there's no question about it. And keeping these people alive for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and killing thousands of innocent animals to feed them, that's, that's insane. That's a completely insane position if you care about innocent beings and you care about justice. Certain humans have to be cut loose. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening.